if you haven't, I really encourage you, of course, if you're online, if you haven't seen the first one, to go onto our YouTube page and watch that. Uh, it's a great kind of springboard into part two. And as I said last week, we will be looking at three parts, uh, three different sections of the, of the prodigal son, the, the, the actual prodigal son himself, the younger brother. And then today, looking at the older brother. And next week, the father himself. And uh, a very important aspect of the, of the prodigal son. Who's, who knows this, of this parable? Seven of you. Oh, that's better, bro. Thank you so much. John. Hey, John. Thank you, John. Okay. So we're going to read together Luke 15. You want to turn there. We're going to read together Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. I have some reading glasses at home that no one has actually seen me with. And uh, um, I find it a bit more comfortable. My Bible's not too bad, but anyhow, let me try with my Bible here. Dawn's Bible, you try to read that thing with no glasses, it's impossible. The writing's about a half a millimeter high, the typing. All right, so, verse 11, 15. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So the father just divided the property between the two sons. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. I think this thing is facing the wrong way. It's it's too high. I can just feel it. Sorry, that's why you're going to struggle there. Let me just bring it down. Give me a second. Stuck this with. There we go. I'm going to do that. So stick it on my face. Is it on? There we go. All right. Tariq, you carry on. Alrighty, where were we? <clears throat> and the teacher said, sorry, no, no, wrong one, wrong one. Father, give him my share of the inheritance in this state, so he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living after he had spent everything there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need Neil you want to take that put it under your chair thank you interesting eh after he spent everything he had there was a severe severe famine not before afterwards he spends everything, severe famine, and he gets in need. So interesting in our lives. It's like we get to the, we end up using our resources and something even worse happens. Amen? The Lord always trying to teach us a lesson. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against you, against heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his his father saw him and was filled with compassion and ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. We can't wait for next week's message on the father. It's going to be brilliant. The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your father. Father, shut his mouth. (laughs) <laughs> but the father said to his servants quickly bring the best robe and put it on him 
put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called out to one of the servants and asked him what is going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became very happy. <laughs> the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, the dad pleading with the son. But he answered the father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and, you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet, you never even gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours Has squandered, who has squandered your wealth and property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf. Highly prophetic. I don't know how people wouldn't know that he squandered with prostitutes. But anyway, my son, the father said, you always are with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive, was lost and is found. So there you see the, the older brother's reaction. I've got all the leaders praying for me today while I'm preaching. I ask them to pray under their breath that I would finish in 30 minutes. They're all praying. So they're all fasting today. Oh Lord, let him finish in 30 minutes. Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. All right. So three, three big points and then a couple of sub points. Here we go. Remember I spoke quickly about the, older, the younger brother last week and I said what? He left home, hit rock bottom and returned home. Essentially three main points of the younger brother's kind of journey there. The older brother, of course, never left home. He was always at home. So let's talk about him this morning. Number one, bear in mind, quickly, the older brother is a son, just like the younger brother. The younger brother is a son, is he not? Yes. And the older brother is a son. They both live on the father's estate or lived, were, were part of the son. They the part of the father. They carried the father's DNA. Who's with me? And just as we looked at some parallels between us and the younger brother, who give me my, stay, my share of the estate, dishonorably leaves the house, hits rock bottom, and then comes to his senses and returns. And now we, do you know that last week, Dawn, the guy shared it on Facebook, that last week after the meeting, we had two people message us on Facebook and said uh, um, that they have come home. Someone, that, that one of them said that it's a, They've never seen the prodigal son like that in that way, that the story, and they have come home. And someone else said, thank you so much for that message. I have come home. Come on, amen. amen. Beautiful. They watched the live stream together. So if you, on the live stream, you're not second-rate citizens. Amen. amen. But uh, trust that the Father blesses you with revelation and, uh, and power. All right, so the older brother, what is a parallel... Is it getting too cold there, Ellison? Hey? Are oh, you fine? Okay, are the, are the fans on there? They don't have to be on. Do you want to turn them off? Thanks, Ryan. Just that one's on, I think. It's blowing on those people there. On Brett. Thank you. 
in our, in our old venue, we had six uh, air cons, in the one we, that we hired a long time ago. And uh, um, we had to eventually take those air con remotes, there was one remote for each air con, 18,000 BTU air cons, nice for summer. And we eventually had to confiscate those remotes and hide them. Because you must know how these Christians could fight. The guys wanted it down to the, to the 16s. The, 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 the ladies wanted it up to the 25s. They were too cold. The, the guys were too hot. Oh, my gosh. Eventually, we said, all right, give us the aircon remotes. We'll set it at 15 because I'm a guy. And, uh, and then Dawn and I started boxing. For, no, I'm just kidding. And we, I think we left it on 20 and said, that's it. It's done. Anyhow, you need a bit of leadership now and again, eh, Neil? All right. So three points quickly, Craig. As a son, the older brother harbored unforgiveness consistently yeah. toward his brother. Now, this is the word consistently is not up there. I don't have it in my notes. I just stuck it in there right now. He harbored unforgiveness toward his brother for a long, long time. I can guarantee you. As a father, as you'll talk about next week, as a father sat at the window sill, kind of just pining for his son to come home, perhaps a, a flame in the window sill so his son could see his way home. The brother was completely and utterly miffed in his bedroom that the younger brother had done what he had done. And he harbored this resentment and unforgiveness for a long time. So meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come home. Can you imagine in that moment what happens? Your brother has come home. And he's like, oh. And your father has killed the fattened. What has the father done? The fattened calf. It's not, not a fattened calf. The fattened calf. There was only one. Can you see that? He killed the fattened calf for this kid. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out, pleaded with him. And he answered, but he answered, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you've never given me even a young goat with, my, for my friend, with me and my friends. But when this son of yours, not even my brother anymore, this son of yours, remember I said that last week, Adam and Eve, when the woman you put here with me, the woman you put here with me, it's your wife, Adam. <laughs> you see, the, 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 the younger brother, we know, we spoke about it last week, but the younger brother, there was things he was carrying in his own heart. There's an immaturity here. There's a lack of wisdom here. He's gone and done something that he should not have done. Who's with me? Clearly, he's done something that he should not have done. The father, knows, the father knows what the son is going through. He understands, you know, he's not pleased with what the son's doing because it's a lack of faith. He's not pleased with the, what the younger brother's done. But he understands and he empathizes. Jesus on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They're immature. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. So the younger brother, instead of seeing that and going, this is what my brother has been going through. You see, friends, when, when we as believers don't see other believers like this, when we see people in the world and we want to hold them to a specific standard, when they're unsaved, number one, you can't, even, you can't do that. They don't even know Jesus. They, don't even, they have no understanding of the light of the gospel of Christ. So we can't hold them to any standards. Who's with me? Don't get miffed with politicians. They don't, know what, they don't know what they're doing. Oh, they know clear, full, full well. No, they don't. Because they don't understand the glory of the gospel. Amen. And so when greed grips a person, greed has gripped that person. They need a higher source. Who's with me? And when people in the church do things that upset us, you know, instead of empathizing, instead of going, you know, Lord, that person's immature. I've sat with leaders before. And we're talking about someone and something's happened. And I've said to the guy, don't take it personally. And they, they, I promise you, even though they might be directing their anger and frustration at you, don't take it personally. Number one, you'll never survive in the ministry if you do. <laughs> don't take it personally. Of course, you don't just fob it off. 
but you can talk about it and say, let's talk, but what's, what's happening with you? What, what are you? Why are you feeling this way? What's going on? <laughs> so everyone stops and looks at Tariq. What is that, Tariq? Is that the lapel? All right. There we go. It's gone now. That's back again. It's gone now. It's back again. I'm just, maybe it's helping there, Ryan. Just pull some, some of the lows out, some of the, the gain down. Just tweak, tweak, tweak a bit. All right. So, we're just trying something new. We've got the receiver this side now, not that side, because there's some drops and pops. So, just bear with us. You see, when, when people offend us and we become bitter, <laughs> it's getting worse. Right down here. If we don't understand, as I was saying, if we don't understand the wisdom, we don't understand the immaturity, then we can't pray for them, we can't really want to connect with them because we become embittered and take it personally. Who's with me? And then what we do is we, we become, see what the Pharisees are doing. They were setting themselves up as judges and juries and executioners. Interestingly, he goes, what does he say? He says, when this son of yours has gone off and squandered your wealth, okay, your wealth, well, the father already apportioned it to the younger son, the one, the one third, that's what he gets as the younger son. The older brother gets two thirds. When you have, when you have squandered, when he has squandered this wealth of yours with prostitutes, while living in prostitutes, there's no way he could have known that this, this young kid was a prostitute. It just says debauchery in the, in the, Jesus was speaking of wild living. But we don't know what that means. But what he does is, because he's offended, he takes anything that comes into his mind, the worst possible scenario, and then accuses them of that thing. And what happens with us, friends, when we become offended to one another, we will always think the worst possible thing about that person. We won't try and defend them and think the best. We will try and think, we will think the worst. The worst possible scenario. Look what this person is doing. Amen? That's why when you're counseling a couple or, you know, a, a married couple, the, worst, the first thing you want to do is get rid of the bitterness and the offense. Because there's constant finger pointing and constant uh, um, storytelling about one another and you just don't know what, the, the, you don't know the wood from the trees. So we, you've got to get rid of the bitterness, rid of the resentment. Yeah. Actually, that person is immature or they're acting in a specific way. Okay, let's talk about you. How do, how do you grow in Christ? Amen? Word, let's talk about how we, how we can talk about your life and not the other person. Interesting, he couldn't even share in his master's, in his, in his father's joy. You see that? He says, yeah, he became angry. Uh, well, he couldn't. He couldn't. He says, come, let's go inside and party. But he refused. Now nah, we'll not come in. So whatever joy is going, whatever joy is going on, see, resentment causes frustration, which, which does what? Robs us of our joy. So we can't be happy. Because we're so full of resentment and bitterness. And so what happens when we become... Have you ever seen a depressed person joyful? Depressed people resent themselves. They resent who they are. They resent what they have. They resent what they look like. They resent where they live. They resent everything about themselves. And so they become ultra depressed. But they cannot then share in the joy of anybody else. Because they don't want to go in and celebrate. Amen? And even if they do, it's just a facade because ultimately, deep down inside, there is a resentment and bitterness towards something. And so God calls us out of that place. He doesn't want us to be the older brother. You know, some call it the older brother syndrome. Who's with me? You guys are very quiet this morning. Is it the sound on the microphone? Or has it gone, gone down a bit now? You don't hear it? All right. It does sound a bit softer. I feel like I've got to talk a bit harder to be heard. But anyway. Ephesians 4. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Listen, this turns it on its head. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Woo! See, the father had forgiven the son, the younger brother. As a matter of fact, so much so he said, take him, put a robe over his, over his put sandals on his feet, kill the fattened calf. Fully forgiven the younger brother already. The moment he came home, the father, he's trying to talk. We'll talk about this next week. He's trying to talk. The father's hugging him and kissing him. Shut up. 
the father already forgiven him. But the, the, older, the older brother, I won't forgive him. So what does Ephesians tell us? Forgive just as in Christ God forgave you. So if the, if the father is willing to give, forgive the younger brother, then who are you to hold it against him? As a son of God, you can be mature, you can be mature, you can be immature, you can be all kinds of stuff going on. That person is, lives in the forgiveness of God. Who's with me? So as, as I said last week, talking to someone the other day and they were speaking about, you know, they, that person they have to answer, you're going to have to answer to God. Like there's a whole lot of sin baggage that this guy carries that he still has to take before God and still going to go, still going to go, right, now we're going to talk about your sin. You filthy animal. And now you spoke to that guy the one time at the coffee shop. You're going to answer for that now. No, the Father's already forgiven him in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't talk to each other adult to adult, mature person to mature person, or saying, let's talk about what happened the other day. Because I want peace. Who's with me? What we do, what we do is we go, I just want to kind of stay away from you. So I unfriend you on Facebook, or I block you. Okay? I block you on WhatsApp. And yeah, I'm going to show you, I'm going to, I'm going to punish you now because of what you did. So I'm going to block you now. You check, you you're not going to see my profile picture. <laughs> it's just going to be blank for you. And when I see you, I'm just... <laughs> you're dead to me. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. The Father doesn't want us to be like that. I've already forgiven Neil. Now you forgive him. Now forgiveness and trust are two different things. So you've got to earn my trust. But that doesn't mean I, I just separate myself from you. I'm connect, let's connect. Let's talk about what happened. Amen. And also realize, oh, it's a complete misunderstanding. Oh, flip. As Neil explains his side of the story. Or Neil is apologetic. Hey, I'm sorry, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. Or Neil says, I don't apologize. I still then don't harbor unforgiveness. My hand is always outstretched towards him. Whenever you want to make right, like the father in the window with the lamp with his, with his little oil lamp waiting for the son to come home. Amen. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Okay, so in Colossians 3, bear with each other and forgive each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. How beautiful is that? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Come on now. Very simple. Very, very simple. But exceptionally difficult to outwork without the Holy Spirit. Actually, I want to say this. Impossible to outwork without the Holy Spirit. I know you turned my volume down. Tariq, what's the volume like on the, on the live feed? Sorry, guys. I'm just talking about you to him. Because it gets quite soft there on the camera at home. All right. Number two, big point number two, and I've got six sub points under this and we're done. He was a son but lived like and had the mentality of a slave. He was a son. So big point number one, as a son, he harbored unforgiveness toward his younger brother or toward his brother. Number two, he was a son but had the mentality, lived like and had the mentality of a slave. But he answered his father, verse 21, look, interesting, eh? Also dishonorable. Dad, you know, this, this son, no, look, these years, these many years I've served you. What does it say there? All these years I've, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Oh, yeah. Hey, that doesn't sound so good. Imagine the father, imagine that as a father hearing that coming out of your son's mouth. All these years I've, I've slaved for you. I've been a slave. I've slaved for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never give, gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Complete misunderstanding of the Father. Amen? Yeah. Number one, the younger brother, the older brother says this to himself, I'm going to serve you and you will give me things. And Galatians 4 says, Because you are my sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts and the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, that's a cry. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are His child, you are also made an heir. So many believers come into the kingdom of God, they get born again and they get that mentality. 
I'm going to serve you, God, and then you're going to give me stuff. Because that's how it operates in the kingdom. I serve you, you give me things. I obey your commands, you give me stuff. But that's how religion operates. Did you know that? Matter of fact, number two. Well, let's stand number one quickly. I'm going to serve you, you'll give me things. All right? So, so I'm not a son. I'm a slave, and a slave works for wages, and, and when he's finished working, he gets given stuff. So you see, the son goes, I've slaved for you, and I've, ob- dis- and I've obeyed every order that you've given me, and then I've waited for the goat, and the goat has never come. So what kind are you? You're a terrible taskmaster. But then this guy, you just you ask for his, you just give it to him, and he, and he goes off, and he comes back, and you give him more stuff. He completely disobeyed everything, and you just continue lavish him with grace. Me... I'm trying to deal with you legalistically and I'm getting nothing from you. Amen. Because God operates through grace, not through legalism. He blesses his sons. He doesn't bless slaves. A slave only gets what he deserves at the end of the day. Amen. And so the father wants us to jettison slave mentality because he wants to bless us as a son. As a matter of fact, he has already blessed us. We'll get into that just now. Number two, I'm going to obey your orders and you'll be pleased with me. So many people come into the kingdom and say, if I just obey God, his orders, then he's going to be pleased with me. He'll be happy with me. Again, think about what religion is based on. Religion is based on that precept. One, I obey and you give me things. Number two, I obey and you're pleased with me. Think of every religion on the planet. As long as I'm obeying the, that God's precepts, whether it be in the Bhagavad Gita, whether it be in the Quran, whether it be in uh, uh, the uh, Book of Mormon, or whatever book, whatever religion you have out there, uh, Feng Shui, I comb my, I comb my, 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 my yard a specific way, or my little thing, you know, my little, I put all the mirrors up, I open certain windows. As long as I obey all these things, God out there will be pleased with me. And if He's pleased with me, then He's going to be, He's going to smile, He's going to give me nice things. We come back to that same point again. Amen. Yet the Father doesn't operate like that. He operates through grace. Through grace. We are saved by grace through faith. Now there are many things written in the New Testament that are, that are, that are spoken of for us to do. Love one another. Honor one another. Amen? Amen. And Paul gives many, many directives in the New Testament. But those are not orders to be obeyed. Those are, those are things that we do as the Holy Spirit pulls us deeper and deeper and deeper into the obedience of faith. Who's with me? Number three, quickly, running out of time, I've got three minutes. You are not fair, Father. Yet you never even gave me a goat to celebrate my friends. When bitterness sets in, you know what happens? When God begins to do things, we, 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 we call God unfair you are unfair you are unfair how many children you have siblings and the children immediately talk about how unfair it is because that child got something and they didn't and you're like you live in my home i give you everything all the time but because there's jealousy and there's bitterness and there's all kinds of immaturity and and stuff going on inside that inside that child they 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 deem the parents unfair and you're going "I'm, i'm not being unfair amen that's why we sometimes we struggle to celebrate with someone else that's, that's getting something good because we think, well, hey, where's mine? Amen. Number four, why do you overlook my hard work? But he answered his father, look all these years I've been slaving for you. I've been slaving for you and you haven't even seen what I've done. You think, you think the father's been off, blind, he doesn't know what's going on, he can see what's going on. But that's the mentality, you see. I've been slaving for you, look at you, can't you see what I'm doing? The father loves the older brother. He doesn't want him slaving for him. Yes, he wants him out in the field, it's all part of, you know, what tr- you think of, the, of, the, of, a, of a rich family. Think of the Trumps, let's talk about the Trumps for a second. All the Trumps are involved in the family business. They would have grown up watching their dad. 
not forced by gunpoint you will follow you will start selling property you no they just they get sucked into because it's just so dynamic and they see their dad passionate about it and so they want to run into it and then they become famous like he's become amen and probably made a lot of money just like he has in their own things the father wants us to to work alongside him because it's part of operating in the kingdom and expanding and growing his kingdom who's with me that's the point it's not come slave you're a slave in my I'm gonna I'm gonna have you slave and I'm gonna pay your wages no we're gonna work work with God and work for him as we as we build the kingdom amen many times in the church people come in here hey it's want the pastor to see me working or you let the pastor see me or the leaders let the leaders see me let me, let me tell you this the Lord can see everything you do and including the motive of your heart so when you have that mentality you will do everything to be seen when you go the father is the one that promotes me he knows my heart I'm not trying to jockey for position I'm gonna do even things behind the scenes that no one's gonna know not a one soul is gonna find out because the father knows what I'm doing Who's with me? I'm not slaving. I'm like, God, are you, are you watching me? Hey, no one else sees me, but you are. You, you better bless me. Actually, the Father sees me. He loves me as a son, and I want to, I want to please him, and I want to do all the things he's called, to me, and called me to do. And I want to be faithful with the little things in my life so that he can bless me with more. Amen. Who's with me? Just taking one step at a time. Number five. As a son, he failed to see the provision of his father. I don't want to go too far into this. The father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Think about that. You are always with me and everything I have is yours. Think about that concept. What is, what is mine is yours. So we, we are co-equal heirs. There's a couple of scriptures there. Um, there. There. Let's read that. Listen, listen to what he says. For he chose us, uh, um, blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Say every, every. spiritual blessing. Not some. Every spiritual blessing. If you jump to the next one, please, Laura. His divine power has given us most things we need. Everything. When the, Bible, when the Holy Spirit writes a word there, you must know that he wants you to know that's the word. Everything. Everything everything we need for life and godness we have been blessed already with everything we need it's inside of us but it's in seed form we must be careful to nurture and grow that seed amen that's why it says seek first the kingdom and all the things of pagans because while i'm seeking the kingdom what i'm doing is i'm nurturing that seed and growing that seed to become a huge righteous oak in my life amen And then Hebrews 6 12 uh, uh, we do not want you to become lazy this is lazy with regards to things of the kingdom but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherited what, what what is promised faith and patience what do you use to nurture that seed faith and patience faith and patience I could tell you a couple stories faith and patience faith and patience I'll quickly I'll, let me quickly say it now we've basically done I've got one point left and it's a quick one faith and patience when I was in our previous church some, some of you would have heard the story already but when I was in my previous our previous church uh, um, the last year they were there I knew that God had called us to full-time ministry many many years before we even went into full-time ministry I had a business with two other guys and it did very very well but I knew that God had called Dawn and I into that well Dawn was already working as a secretary in the church the admin on the admin staff but I knew the Lord not called me into business, although I loved it, and I loved making the money. It was just, I knew it. And so, after about another, another couple joined the eldership team, we were, we were on eldership, they joined the eldership team, they'd been on eldership about two years. I remember where I was and I got the phone call, the lead guy, his name was Mark, he phoned me, he said, Craig, I've been on the phone to some other guys, some team guys, NCMI team guys, and exciting news we're going to bring daniel and julie on full time on staff don't have been around for like five years they've been around for one year 
They come basically came, they were an eldership of another church, they were around for a few months and they came so into eldership. How are we going to, and, and, and in that moment, my heart hit my toes. And I felt the Lord said to you though, just be pa- just, it's not your time. Just be patient. Just trust the process. Trust me. And you can ask Dawn how busy I was and what was happening in my life. And then, about, I don't know, maybe two years later, somewhere else, I get the call. There's another couple that came with the eldership. I get the call. Craig, we been chatting a little bit. We're going to bring Joe and Joanne Bloggs onto full time on staff on eldership. And my heart hit my toes for a second time. And I felt the Father say, Trust the process. Faith and patience, son. And about a year, and a, a year later, whatever it was, a year and a half later, we were at an eldest time away and they said, We want you, Craig to come and join us full time. This other couple that actually went back into the marketplace. It's a long story, but we want you to join us. So I took a couple of months to extricate myself from my business with my partners and I went full time. But the point is this, from the first phone call, it was about three and a half years before that actually happened. I was over, I'm being overlooked, I'm I'm working hard, aren't you seeing? No, none of that stuff. The Lord knows what He's doing. Amen? He knows. He will provide. He will at the right time give you what you need for the job. Who's with me? Number six, the last one. He was, why don't we stand together? He was in a constant state of tension and frustration. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. Friends, when we, when we don't understand who God is, when we don't understand the Father, and we carry an older brother mentality, we are in a constant state of frustration and anger. And you know when you're angry, you know you don't see it straight. You can't see life straight because you, you're frustrated and you're angry. That's why, you know, I love mixed martial arts, I love the, the sport. Guys go and they train very hard and they, and they, they, they come with, when they're fighting, they're not, hey, I'm so angry, I just want to club this oak. Yes, I'm angry. They're very methodical in how they operate because you can't go in there angry, you'll lose the fight. They focus and then they've got, a, they've got a game plan. They don't come in there just start to slug it out like two guys on the, uh, on the street having a big fight. You see, when we're angry, you actually miss the game plan. Amen. And God has a game plan for you and I. He has a path that He wants us to walk on. But when we become angry like the older brother because of all the things we feel like we're not getting, we actually miss the path. And it's a vicious circle that goes round and round and round. Amen. So, Father, I thank you for your people this morning.